Of all the tests uh, that I had to take in school, the one that I dreaded the most was the pop quiz. The pop quiz. I had a professor who loved to give these. We would walk in and then he would announce that we had a pop quiz that, that morning. All of our hearts would sink, you know, because, you know, because you can't fake your way through a pop quiz, can you? I, I mean, either you're up on your reading and everything you're supposed to be doing and then it's fine or you're caught out and, and it's, it's just the worst. The pop quiz reveals all, right? And you might be thinking, thank goodness, I don't have to deal with pop quizzes anymore. That was in my past. Uh, But the reality is the Bible tells us that the ultimate pop quiz is coming. The ultimate pop quiz is coming. In fact, it could happen any day. It could happen today. Because Jesus is going to return. And the clock of history will stop. And all of us will stand before the living God. We will give accounts of our lives. It's the ultimate pop quiz. And unlike the pop quizzes we took in school, uh, you and I, we can't afford to flunk this pop quiz. So the question is, how do you make sure you're ready? How do you get ready for this ultimate pop quiz? That's what Jesus is going to teach us this morning. So grab your Bibles. We're going to be in Luke chapter 12. We're going to look at verses 35 down to 59 this morning. Luke 12, 35 to 59. If you want to use the Pew Bible, you'll find that in the seat back right in front of you by your knees. Just pull that out. You can join us on page 871, wrapping over to 872. 871 to 872. This is Luke 12, 35 to 59. And in this passage that we're looking at today, Jesus is going to give us four ways to get ready for the greatest pop quiz of all time, the return of our once and future king, Jesus himself. I'll give you the, uh, the four things we're going to learn up front. We'll pray and we'll jump in, okay? That's our plan. So here we go. Here's the four things. Be alert, be faithful, be loyal, and be prepared. There's your outline. Be alert, be faithful, be loyal, be prepared. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? And we'll begin. Father, we pray today that you would prepare us to be ready, to be ready for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. All of history is heading toward this grand climax when Jesus returns, sets all things to rights, And uh, we want to be ready for that moment. So help us to live in light of the return of the King this morning. We pray that you would be our teacher by the power of your Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen. 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 All right. So Jesus is coming back. Get ready. Way number one, be alert. Be alert. Uh, You may recall from last time we were here in the book of Luke that Jesus has told his disciples that they are to seek first the kingdom of God. That was back in Luke 12, 31. Seek first the kingdom of God. And of course, we know that Jesus is the king. And so if Jesus is the king and he's the one who's ushering in God's kingdom, what you really have between the first and second comings of Jesus is you have a first and second sort of wave of the kingdom's coming. In the first coming of Jesus, he inaugurates the kingdom, it breaks into the world, but it isn't until the second coming of Jesus that the kingdom is consummated in all of its glorious fullness. And so the question is, what does it mean to seek first the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, when we live between the first and second comings of Jesus? We're in this margin in between, and so how do we live in light of this kingdom? We know who the king is, and we know the fullness of what kingdom come will mean, but how do we seek first the kingdom when we're in the middle? Jesus is going to tell us. That's what this whole section is about. So look at chapter 12, verse 35. Stay dressed for action, Jesus says, and keep your lamps burning. Pause for a moment. There's two images quickly in this opening phrase. 
uh, we have uh, a soldier, first image. A soldier literally is girding up his loins, which is a funny phrase, right? But gird up your loins is literally what it says. Uh, they, in the ancient world, they would, they would wear these long robes and you couldn't move quickly if you had them out. So they would wrap them up and tuck them into their belts, sort of through their legs, and they would gird up their loins. It meant they were ready to run or act quickly or do whatever. And so soldiers would gird up their loins, athletes would gird up their loins like this. That's what Jesus says, gird up your loins. Look at the person next to you and say, gird up your loins. Yeah, all right, good, excellent, excellent. All right, so then the second image here is a watchman, a watchman, keep your lamps burning. The idea is late into the night, keen eye, looking out, don't fall asleep. Jesus says, that's how I want you to be. I want you to be ready, poised, alert. Okay, let's keep going. Jesus gives us a third image in a mini parable. Look at verse 36. And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from a wedding feast so that that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. So first century Jewish weddings uh, took forever. They would be multi-day events, sometimes over a week. And uh, you know how families are when you get together with family and you, you travel's hard and you think, oh, I'll just stay another day, right? You know, I have friends, they'll put me up, whatever. So that's what the idea here is. And of course, they don't have phones and cell phones and they can't text anybody. So communication is very slow. So all of a sudden, the master doesn't show up as planned, but then he's going to show up maybe another time, right? That's the idea here. And then Jesus says, look, look at the ways they, they might respond. Verse 37, blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he'll dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, <laughs> blessed are those servants. So if, 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 the, if the master walks up, knocks on the door and the door immediately swings open, just as soon as he knocks, it means they've been waiting up for him, right? And they didn't know when he was come, but they've been diligent, they've been alert. They, they're eager to receive him and welcome him. Even if he, and the later the hour in the middle of the night, the more meaningful their response is, right? If he shows up in the second or third watch, depending on how you use this, the Romans had one way of reckoning watches and the Jews had different ones. So this is either between 9 p.m. and 3 a.m. or between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. The point is the same either way. It's not regular business hours when he shows up, right? So if he shows up in the wee hours of the morning and the servants click the door right open and they're waiting for him, the master's gonna be pleased. He's gonna be delighted. They've gone above and beyond what he would have expected. And he'll throw a special dinner party for them, Jesus says, and he himself will wait on them hand and foot. And Jesus says, that's the kind of servant I want you to be. I want you to be waiting like that for my return. The fourth image Jesus uses here is a thief in the night. Look at verse 39. But know this, if the master of a house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. So you must also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So Jesus is piling up these images to form a composite impression. Gird your loins for action. Keep those lamps burning. Stand poised at the door for the master's return. Don't leave the the house unguarded. Why? For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. That's the main point. The Son of Man is coming at an hour you don't expect. Now, when Jesus calls himself the Son of Man here, he's alluding to Daniel's prophetic vision in chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 in the book of Daniel, which reads this way. Behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a Son of Man. There's the phrase. And he came to the Ancient of Days, God himself, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom and all peoples, nations, and languages will serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. This is, this is kingdom language and imagery, isn't it? 
So the Son of Man is the one who will inherit the kingdom of God in all of its worldwide fullness and will rule and reign forever. And Jesus says, I want you to seek that kingdom. I want you to be looking to the coming of the King, the Son of Man. I want you to be alert because I'm going to show up at an hour you don't expect. Don't be snoozing. Don't be goofing off. Don't be slacking. Don't get caught off guard. I'm coming back. So get ready. Be alert. Be alert. Secondly, be faithful. Be faithful. Look at verse 41. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? Who, who, who should be on high alert like this, Jesus? Are you, are you talking about just us, the 12 disciples, the core, the apostles, the core disciples? Or are you instructing all of us disciples, all these other disciples that are gathered around here? And in response, Jesus, he basically says, I'll let you decide if this parable applies to you. I'll let you decide. You decide. I'll, let me expand this parable. Let me explore the responses of four different kinds of servants, and you decide what kind of servant you want to be in response. Servant number one, verse 42. And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over the household and give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. So the first kind of servant here is one who's faithful and wise, who is given significant uh, household responsibilities, including allocation of food for the other servants each day. And Jesus says, blessed is the servant that the master finds doing what he was supposed to be doing when he returns. He'll give that faithful servant a promotion, right? That's a good servant. Second kind of servant response here, verse 45. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. And in an hour he does not know and he will cut him to pieces and put him with the unfaithful. <laughs> So the second kind of servant is one who takes advantage of this master's absence, right? While the cat's away, the mice will play, right? And this guy decides to get drunk, drunk on power, drunk on indulgence. He takes all the food he was supposed to give to the other servants and eats it himself. He abuses the servants who are in his care and responsibility. And he, Jesus says, that guy's going to get caught off guard, when the master returns. And when he does, he's going to tear him limb from limb. It's a colloquial phrase. It's not literal. It's like he's going to knock his head off. You know, it's that kind of idea. And then he's going to banish him. And he's going to put him with the place of the unfaithful, the unemployed people who, who are not worthy to have a job. He'll fire him. That's the point. Servant number three, third kind of response, is in verse 47. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will, will receive a severe beating. So the third kind of servant response here knows that the master wants certain things done, decides, eh, I'm just not going to do it, you know? Um, he's not toxic or evil or abusive like the second servant, but this guy fails to do what the good he was supposed to have done, what the master asked He's not been a faithful servant. Now, in Greco-Roman culture, uh, where slaves were mistreated regularly, this guy should expect a severe beating. It's pretty normal. For, verse four, uh, or not verse four, servant number four, kind of response here is in 48a. But the one who did not know um, uh, and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. So this fourth servant is ignorant. He doesn't know what the master wanted and uh, doesn't do it like the third uh, servant. But in this case, he didn't really know better. And so his punishment will be subsequently a lighter punishment. Now, 
please don't get stuck or hung up on the language of beatings here. I know it's a little rough. Uh, Jesus is not sanctioning violence against servants. He's simply illustrating with vivid word pictures that his audience would readily relate to in his Greco-Roman world. His point is this, which of these servants do you want to be? Which one do you want to be? Do you want to be like the ignorant servant who failed his master but got off with a light punishment? Do you want to be like the negligent servant who knowingly slacked off and paid the price? Do you want to be like the corrupt servant who willfully disobeyed, got drunk, became abusive, and will face the full wrath of the master? Or do you want to be a wise, good, and faithful servant who did just what his master wanted and received his blessing and promotion as a reward? Well, the, the answer is obvious, isn't it? Which one do you want to be? You want to be the first servant. You want to be the good and faithful servant. Now, Peter asks, is this for us, just the 12, or is it for everybody? And Jesus says, well, you tell me. You decide. Which kind of servant do you want to be? Do you want to be a good and faithful servant? Well, then, if, if you do, then you know the answer. This, these parables are for you. Be alert. Be faithful. Verse 48b, everyone to whom much is given, of of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. Jesus is saying, look, as my disciples, you've been entrusted with a great responsibility. You know your master's heart. You've been shown the way of Jesus. You've been entrusted with the good news of the gospel. You've been called to be fishers of men, to make disciples of all nations. You're to seek first the kingdom of God with all your life. And Jesus says, one day I'm coming back. I'm going to return. And the question is, will we be found faithful in our lives? Which servant will Jesus find us to be when he returns. Hmm? It's sobering, isn't it? It's sobering. Jesus is coming back. So get ready. Be alert. Be faithful. Number three, be loyal. Be loyal. Verse 49, I came to cast fire on the earth and wood that it were already kindled I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. This is interesting. Remember John the Baptist's description of Jesus back in Luke 3, 16? He said, Jesus, the one who comes after me, he will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. Do you remember that? He was echoing a phrase from Malachi chapter 3 that talks about the refiner's fire, the the servant of the Lord who will come and bring the refiner's fire to the earth that will purge evil from this planet and bring the day of judgment and purify God's people. And here in Luke chapter 12, Jesus is saying, yep, that's me. That's my assignment. I'm the one to bring the fire, the purifying Judgment is indeed coming. Oh, that it were already here. But first, I have something to do. I must first face my own baptism. Now, what is he talking about, his own baptism? I have a baptism, baptism to be baptized with, he says. What is he talking about? He, he's talking about his own death on the cross. And we know this because uh, Jesus used the same language when he was talking with James and John when they asked to sit at his right and left hands in the kingdom of God. He said this in Mark 10, 38. Jesus asked, are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism with which I will be baptized? He's talking about the cross. I'm going to the cross. Are you willing to join me in my suffering, James and John? So Jesus is saying here, he says, look, I've come to bring fire and purifying judgment to the earth, but first I must face the fire myself. I must climb up on that cross. I must bear the sins of humanity. I I must make full atonement 
And see, friends, this is the wonder of the gospel. Because in our sinfulness, we, can, we cannot bear to face the day of fire and judgment on our own. But in the mercy and grace of Christ, Christ came to die in our place and for our sake. He became our substitute before God. On the cross, he faced the fires of judgment so that when we trust in him, we will be forgiven and stand acceptable before God, cleansed and holy and pure and clothed in the righteousness of Christ himself. Jesus says, I'm going to be baptized with fire before I bring the fire down. And Jesus says, I'm in distress until it is, an, it is accomplished. Literally in the Greek, it is finished. Until it is finished. What does that remind you of? On the cross, Jesus says, it is finished. See, Jesus knows what this cross will cost him. He knows what's coming. And he knows what this cross will mean for humanity as everyone will face the choice of what to do with Jesus Christ. Will they accept him as their savior and Lord and king or will they reject him and his salvation and face him as judge when he comes again? And Jesus knows this division is coming. Everyone must choose. That's why he continues in verse 51. Do you think I've come to bring peace on the earth? No, I tell you rather division. From now on, one ho- in one house, there will be five divided, three against uh, two, two, two against three, sorry. No, he says it both ways. Three against two, two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Law. See, see, what Jesus is about to do on the cross, friends, will be so significant, such a watershed of events, that it will force a decision upon every single human being that will cut through the deepest of family bonds. In the first century world, family was everything. And Jesus says, your loyalty to me as your Savior, Lord, and King is even higher than the loyalty you have to your very own family. And here's the central question for each one of us, friends. Where does our loyalty lie? Where does our loyalty lie? When push comes to shove, are you and I, are we with Jesus all the way? Are we with him all the way? So Jesus is coming back. We got to get ready. Be alert, be faithful, be loyal, and then finally be prepared. Be prepared. Verse 54, he also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once a shower is coming. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say there will be a scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? In Israel, like Chicago, the the weather comes from the west most of the time. And the clouds would form over the Mediterranean and they would blow inland and then it would rain. And then when the wind picks up from the south, it's coming from the south, it's, it's gonna bring a heat wave usually, right? And Jesus says, you pay attention to all that stuff. And what's the point? You watch the horizon so you will know how to live in light of what's coming so you get an umbrella or sunscreen or whatever, right? And that's smart, but it's just weather. It's just circumstantial. Why would you not watch the horizon of history so that you can live in light of what's coming, Jesus is saying. The Son of Man is coming and he's gonna bring fire and judgment upon the earth and establish his glorious kingdom forever. Why would you not live in light of that reality here and now? Why would you not live in light of that? You watch for weather forecasts. Why don't you pay attention to what's going on in history? Now watch how he applies this principle with another parable, verse 57. And why do you not judge for yourselves what is right? 
As you go with your accuser before the magistrate, make an effort to settle with him on the way, lest he drag you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and the officer puts you in prison. I tell you, you won't get out until you've paid the very last penny. Jesus says, look, look, imagine you have legal troubles and you know you're not going to win. So you, do, you would do your very best to settle as soon as possible. That's in your best interest. Stubbornly ignoring the reality of your plight will only backfire in the end. Right? When you're, as my grandpa would say, when you're in a hole, stop digging. Right? Now, what's he saying? Remember, this is in the flow of the entire context. What is he saying? He's saying, listen, the Son of Man is coming. And he's going to bring fire and judgment upon the earth, and he will establish his glorious kingdom forever. And if you know, listen, if you know you're going to face the bar of justice, and there's no way for you to win, you know you're going to lose, you would best find a way to settle with your accuser before it's too late. What's the implication in the context? Get right with Jesus before it's too late. Get right with Jesus before it's too late. Because here's the reality, friends. We can either embrace Jesus as our Savior now, or we will face him as our judge later. We can either face Jesus as our Savior now, embrace him as our Savior now, or face him as our judge later. We can trust in Jesus, the one who faced the fires of judgment on our behalf before God, or we... Um, or we can go in on our own and pretend we're, that it's not a problem and the consequences fall. What we cannot do, listen, what we cannot do is ignore Jesus forever. We can't ignore him forever. He's the once and future king. He came once as savior and he will come again as judge. So you better be prepared. That's what Jesus is saying. Today is the day of salvation. Jesus is coming back. This is a call from Christ to get ready, to to be alert, to be faithful, to be loyal, to be prepared. It's a call to live in light of the return of the King. It's a call to live in light of the return of the King. As we draw to a close here, I, I want to speak to two groups of people in this room in particular. Uh, some of you are here and, um, and you don't know Jesus. We're so glad you're here. We're glad you're listening. We're glad you're engaged. We're glad you're seeking what it means to follow Christ. Um, this text for you is a call to get right. It's a call to get right with the living God. Um, to embrace him as your savior, as your Lord, as your king, so that you don't have to face him as your judge in the end. And the Bible is so clear that if we will admit that we are sinners and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, commit our lives to him, we will be saved. And so we, I invite you to take seriously the call of the gospel and, and the demands of history upon your life. The, the second group I want to speak directly to is uh, those of us who know Jesus, who know Jesus. And this is a call to get serious, to get serious. Stop snoozing, to not stop goofing off, to stop messing around, to stop being so lukewarm, to stop making excuses. Uh, to stop babysitting our sin, uh, to stop being half-hearted in our discipleship of Jesus. You know, the, the great myth is we k- keep telling ourselves, you know, I can get serious later. I'm just going to have a little fun now. I'll get serious later. And I, I tell you, I, I, as a pastor, I've buried too many people that had sudden moments where they did not have more time and they never saw it coming. Friends, you, kn- you don't know when you have no more time. And the reality is Jesus can come back at any minute. He can come back now. And all of a sudden you stand before the living God 
And all of a sudden, it doesn't matter what you were doing to mess around. It all gets real, real fast. And this is a call to get serious with your faith. Friends, it's time that we learn to live in light of the return of the King. Because Jesus is coming back. The ultimate pop quiz will arrive. And you and I, we have to be ready. So be alert. Be faithful. Be loyal. Be prepared. Because our once and future king will return. Who knows? It could even be today. Do you bow your heads and pray with me? Let's pray. Father, it's a sobering thing to face reality. We spend a lot of our life trying to ignore these basic things, that we could die at any moment, that at any moment Jesus might return and all things will be held accountable. And so, Father, help us to let eternity shape our days, that we might number our days aright, that we might live in reality, not in some dream or some sticking our head in the sands reality, but the real world, the real world of cosmic history of the once and future King Jesus. So help us to live in light of what's real, to calibrate to that reality. Father, by the power of your spirit, do a deep work in our hearts and lives. We want to surrender to you in every way. We pray this in Jesus' matchless name, our once and future King. Amen and amen.